Financial Issues, where we join reality with truth, helping you make the most of your money by honoring God with your investments. Now listen in as we give you the practical tools and advice you need to become a biblically responsible investor. Welcome to Financial Issues, everybody. Good to be here with you. Seth Udinsky hanging with you this morning for the first part of the program. Great to be here with you. 610-363-1110 is the number to call in if you want to join the conversation. 610-363-1110. Folks, please do pray for the believers in Florida right now, right in the middle of the state uh, as they're facing down the threat of uh, Hurricane Milton. Really scary stuff. Uh, we have some team members down there, of course. Uh, pray for protection for them and for all the believers in the state of Florida right now. 610-363-1110, number to call in. Shanna will be with us later in the program as well as later on in the week. But as for right now, let's get to the verse of the day today. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So folks, I thought it'd be appropriate for us today that we talk about why stewardship matters and we look at a couple lessons as to why stewardship matters. It's a good reminder for us. Oftentimes it's good to do this in a marriage, for example, it's vital uh, when the couple walks through difficult times. Uh, I can recall in the last couple of years, my wife and I have walked through some difficult times. We've had difficult relationships. We've navigated death and family and friends. And so we've had to kind of come together at various times and points and say, hey, listen, we need to remember why we're here. We need to remember we're in this for the long haul. We got to remember what is most important here. So as BRI investors, I think it's good for us to do this, especially right now, uh, as we prepare for the election, as we uh, look at things added to the buy list, as we look at things that maybe we will pare back a little bit, as we look at things that get cut because they're no longer biblically responsible, different things like that, as we're looking to deploy our assets, all those things are happening right now as we speak. In fact, you might even have your investment account open right now uh, as you are waiting to hear what we'll have to say. As we do all these things, remember a couple things, folks, okay? Uh, and you can feel free to write these down if you'd like or just commit them to memory. Uh, five lessons on biblical stewardship. Number one, lesson one is God owns it all. God owns it all. Please don't uh, become cavalier when you hear us say this at the end of every show. If you don't understand that God owns it all, you will not understand stewardship. This is foundational to stewardship. Now, it's challenging for us when we realize the following two things are true, but they're seemingly opposed to one another. Number one, we own none of what we have. God owns it all. But number two, we are required to treat what we've been stewarded with the utmost care and intentionality. So God owns it all but he commands us to treat it as if it is the most important thing that we own. Now, the reason for that is because it is the most important thing that we have, although we do not own it. Because God owns it, that actually makes the level of importance even higher. You see how that works? We are to treat what we have as if it is of utmost importance because it is. Why? Because God owns it. God assigns the value. Every inch of this universe truthfully belongs to God. And so it humbles us when we realize that that includes the things that are under our care, such as our hard-earned money. The money that you've made at your job or the money that you've made in your investment portfolio, the money that you have made in your income stocks, it's all God's. It's a gift from God. Your spouse your children, your grandchildren, gift from God. Your stuff, your home, your car, your yard. Maybe you're getting into some homesteading. I think that's a really good thing. If you have chickens and they lay eggs, all God's, a gift from God. Your health is a gift from God. It is all his. When we realize this, folks, we come to a place of humility and we can say, oh, wow, thanks be to God for what he has given me. There's no room for pride when we realize that God owns it all. That's the most important lesson, number one. Number two, we have a responsibility to be faithful with what he has entrusted to us. So the fact that God owns everything should do two things for us. First, it should relieve us. Your job is not to uphold every aspect of your life and to be God for everyone around you. It should actually cause you to take a deep breath. The fact that God owns everything, uh, it should hopefully cause you to say, thank you, Lord. Okay, I can take a deep breath here. Your job is not to be God for everyone in your life. Your job is to be faithful with what God has given to you. I have to learn and relearn this lesson over and over again with my children because I want to keep them safe and healthy and I want them to have the best up bringing possible. And most importantly, I want them to know Christ. I am not actually, when it all comes down to it, in control of any of those things. 
What I am in control of is being faithful to the Lord. So I mentioned that last one. I want my children to know Christ. That's most important. I've shared this example before, but I'll say it again. Uh, you know, the, the, the salvation of our little ones really is summed up really well in this way. If you're a parent who wants your children to know and love Christ, you cannot light the fire that will cause their salvation. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Your job is to throw as much timber and kindling wood and logs on that fire as possible so that God willing, in his sovereign grace, if the Holy Spirit lights that fire, then it is burning bright and it'll never go out. It's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's God's job to save. It's our job to cultivate those around us, to take responsibility for them, to do our very best, but to know that ultimately it is God's job. So we have a responsibility to be faithful with what he has entrusted to us. It is not our job to be God, though. Also, this should drive us, though, to want to be better. So first, it should give us relief, but secondly, it should drive us to want to do better. The fact that God owns everything, again, we said this earlier, places a higher value on those things, so you should want to please God with what you have. Your job is not to be God, your job is to be faithful, to be faithful and obedient. That's lesson number two. Lesson one, God's, uh, God owns it all. Lesson two, we have a responsibility to be faithful with what he's entrusted to us. Lesson three, investing the money you have been stewarded is a biblical concept. So I'm going to say this, and this is something that we hint at a lot on the show. I don't know if we really actually say it all that often, but I'm just going to come right out and say it. Investment is found in the Bible. Investing is a biblical concept. Some people will say, no, it's not. That's, that's not true. Yes, it is. Investing is found in the Bible. I actually just read a passage this morning for my own personal uh, growth. Uh, I read the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and there's a verse in there that talks about deploying your assets to seven or eight different places. Now, commentators have wondered if that's talking about generosity or if that's talking more about investments. I think it could be talking about both, but that's one place. That's not even the main place I was thinking of, though. The main passage I was thinking of that talks about investing is the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 where Jesus highlights the virtue of servants making the most out of what the master has entrusted to them. So the two faithful servants in that parable who invested the money that the master had trusted to them, they were the ones who invested, notice. What did they do with the money that the master gave them? They didn't sit on it. They didn't steal it for themselves. They used it to make more money. They invested it. They put it to work. The wicked servant... The one that Jesus highlights not to be like was the one who did not invest. You see how that works? He was the one who sat on his money. He didn't steal the money. Some might argue he was careful with it, but he wasn't obedient to the master with it. The master wanted him to make the most out of it, and he disobeyed. Now, some may say he was afraid of the master. Actually, that's what the servant himself says. I was afraid because I know you're a hard man. But really, what was behind this was that the servant had no love for the master. He didn't care about the master's command to him. He had no love. He had no love for the gift that he'd been entrusted. He had no regard for it. He thought it was okay to just bury it in the sand. We must not do this. We must put what we have to work. And so that's why I submit to you that investing is a biblical concept. It really is. Now, the greater lesson here, folks, is not merely investing. It's to use whatever God has given us for his glory. We've all been gifted in various ways. We played a clip on the show recently where Dan talked about a fellow who he knew uh, who this guy basically said, I haven't been gifted in many ways, but I know how to make money. And this guy gave like one to two million dollars away per year. He just knew how to make money. And Dan would say like, you know, this, this guy couldn't get rid of it fast enough. It kept coming back. However, you've been gifted Make the most of it. That's the lesson here. And you do this by being faithful to him. That's lesson number three. Investing the money you've been stewarded as a biblical concept means we should do it. Lesson number four is as a Christian, you're commanded to invest your money in a way that honors God. So not only are we commanded to invest, but we must do it the right way. We've talked on the show about um, certain Christian groups that don't seem to understand biblically responsible investing. We've mentioned the Southern Baptist Convention has got involved with Guidestone investments, which are not biblically responsible. I don't mean to call out the Southern Baptist Convention in particular here, but it's something that we've talked about over and over on the show. Folks, when we're talking about our investments, it is not enough to merely slap a Christian label onto it. Your, invest your investments must not be funding sinful agendas. They must not be. The scripture commands us to be holy as God is holy, and that includes every aspect of our life, meaning our bank accounts, our investments, where we deploy that money. We must be holy. 
And so this is core to our ministry is that here at the ministry, we offer you ways to do this. The reason why we issue so many sell alerts, sometimes the reason is because the company is not a good company. From a financial perspective, most of the time, it's because the company has become wicked in its investment. And I'm not saying that, you know, companies necessarily can have wicked hearts as humans can. I'm saying their actions, where they're putting their money, is funding wickedness. And we want no part of that. We'll have to do the fifth lesson when we come back here from this break. I hope it's making sense to you folks. As we're kind of coming back to the core of who we are, we'll recap these when we come back and then we'll talk a little bit more about it on the other side of this break. More financial issues coming up right after this. I just love the first book of Exodus. The king says the Jews are too many. Get rid of them. I command you to kill the firstborn. But the midwives to the Hebrews heard the order and what did they do? They defied it and God dealt favorably with the midwives and gave them families. He blessed them for loving life. He blessed them for saving babies. We have re-entered the death cults in this country. You think about how much we elevate death, whether it be the chopping off of parts and we call it transgender care, whether it be shouting our abortion, and you see it so beautifully in John 10.10. 10. It is the divide of the entire scriptures. Now, most people would say John 3.16, but think about it. The enemy has come to lie, steal, cheat, and destroy. I have come to give life and life more abundantly. That's the whole ball game, everybody. It is everything. And we have to have the joy of Jesus Christ to enjoy life and to protect it. It's a gift from above. And Preborn is leading the charge. There are moments in life that define us. Choices determine the courses we take. Choices that create life. Or those that save a life. And some make life worthwhile. There are decisions to stay. Or to go. To remain the same. Or to grow. Sometimes we pray and make peace. Other times we take a stand for what we believe. In celebration, mourning, triumph, and defeat, we are invested in every decision we seek. Despite differences, we have one thing in common, the desire to do all for the glory of God. Keep your wallet aligned with your heart and your investments in harmony with your faith. Timothy Plan, biblically responsible mutual funds, ETFs, and retirement plans. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at timothyplan.com. Read carefully before investing. Welcome back, folks. Open the show talking about why stewardship matters and five biblical lessons on stewardship. I'll recap real quickly. Lesson one, God owns it all. Lesson two, we have a responsibility to be faithful with what he's entrusted to us. Lesson three, investing the money you've been stewarded is a biblical concept. It's a biblical command. Lesson four, as a Christian, you're commanded to invest your money in a way that honors God. And finally, the last lesson here before we look at the markets is you have more than just money to steward. So you've got to steward it well more than just money. I hope that that message gets across here at our ministry, that we are primarily a financial ministry, but we understand that there are actually several things that are more important than your money that you need to be stewarding well. I would argue that money is not even the second or third most important thing on the list of what you should steward. Your sanctification would be more important. Your relationship with Jesus Christ, the gospel, that's all kind of wrapped up in what I think is most important. That takes precedence over everything else. Jesus calls us to pursue him above everything else. That's more important than your money. But you know what else is more important than your money is your family. Men, your wife is more important than your income. I have to preach that to myself. It is so easy to get locked in and married to my work and work hard and work is a good thing. But if you prioritize that over your marriage, that's wrong. That is so wrong. Your wife is more important than your job. Your children are more valuable than your investment portfolio. It's, it's far better to provide for the spiritual needs of your children as well as the physical needs of your children than it is to make money on an investment portfolio. More important. I'd also say your church is more important, your friendships are more important, that one anothering relationships. I'd argue even to a degree your health. I think all these things you could argue are more important from an eternal perspective than your money. So be a good steward of everything 
God has given you, not just your money, but everything that God has given you. Ultimately, we do it for the glory of God. I hope that was encouraging to you today, folks. Thank you for listening to that rant this morning to open the show. Let's take a look at the markets here now. Following Monday's rough outing, markets have been going like this, folks, up and down, up and down. Monday, we had a rough day. The benchmark indices yesterday seesawed back positive territory. They had a good day yesterday. Again, the lesson, they're doing exactly what we've been saying they'll do. They're going up, they're going down, back up, back down, seesawing up and down. By midday, the major indices all positive. The tech heavy NASDAQ, as has been the case, was the most extreme. So when it goes down, the NASDAQ seems to drag it down. When it goes up, the NASDAQ is pulling it up. That's what happened yesterday. The Dow finished uh, 30, uh, uh, 0 0.3 percent in the uh, positive. The S&P 500, almost a full percentage point in the positive. The NASDAQ, almost one and a half percentage points in the positive. That's what we're looking like this morning. Pre-market, slightly down, right near the flat line, though. It's really nothing to uh, go crazy about. So the markets will open in about 10 minutes and we'll see where they go from there. All right, Sam, we got some time to get to an interesting headline this morning, man. Kick it off for us. What do we oh, got this morning? Oh, yes, we do. It yeah. is political season final stretch, and it looks like Kamala yeah. Harris is finally coming out of the basement. She's been doing a couple interviews yeah. recently. Good. Most recently, she went on 60 Minutes. Uh, they gave her kind of a softball interview, but did ask her a couple difficult questions. And most revealing, maybe not revealing, because she has continued to talk about this, but it's the fact she continues to double down on her plans to implement price controls on grocery stores, even though economists, both left, right, and center, say that that's a horrible idea. We actually do have a clip of that. I think we have enough time for it, so yeah. we'll play that right yeah, now. Groceries are 25% higher, and people are blaming you and Joe Biden for that. Are they wrong? We now have historic low unemployment in America among all groups of people. We now have an economy that is thriving by all macroeconomic measures. And to your point, Prices are still too high. And I know that, and we need to deal with it, which is why part of my plan, you mentioned groceries. Part of my plan is what we must do to bring down the price of groceries. I'm taking Harris says she'll press Congress to pass a federal ban on price gouging for food and groceries, but details are yet to be defined. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Details are yet to be defined. You got to love that he has to jump in there and explain know, for her what she actually means, because you know there was probably a tad, a side order of a word salad yeah. there, if you, you had to ask me. But Harris's campaign website says that Harris will go after bad actors who exploit an emergency to rip off consumers by calling for the first ever federal ban on corporate price gouging on food and groceries, which will build on the anti-price gouging statutes already in place in 37 states. Republican critics, not just Republican critics, say this could lead to food shortages if it is, in fact, a price control, some, something like a uh, Soviet-style price control. That remains to be seen if that's actually what it is, although Harris, the way she's talked about it, has suggested that is possibly what it looks like. It should be noted, she does mention these 37 states that have price gouging controls already in place. It's not really what she's talking about. She's talking about simply having food prices being too much at grocery stores, largely caused by inflation. In states like these, what they're really talking about is something you'd see really down in Florida in the next week where people are trapped because of the hurricane, supplies are limited, and sometimes what you'll see in emergencies like that is the local gas station jump up prices by, you know, 50% because they can. That's what that's meant to protect against. It's really not clear exactly what Harris is trying to go after yeah. other than the bad economic policies of the Biden administration. And it is curious that um, in her mind, what is it that the grocery stores have all just conspired within the last four <laughs> years to decide to do this? They've not been doing yeah, it yeah. under Trump and the previous administrations, but now they're just, hey, we can make more money by doing this. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, but I have to ask, Seth, sure. what do you make of this as far yeah. as a plan goes for our economic plan for financial issues? Because people can hear this <laughs> and say, yeah, that doesn't sound like a good idea. What do you say to them? Should we panic? Should we be worried? Or what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Sam. Uh, there's, there's no room to panic here, folks. No need to worry at all. Remember, we're in this for the long term. No matter what happens this November, if Kamala gets elected, listen, you're planning for well beyond that. So I hope that you all can take a sigh of relief as though we, we are seeing, listen, this would not be fun 
um, and it would not be enjoyable at all. Sam, you know, it frustrates me a lot to see this because here's what really happened here. Kamala knows what happened. We all know what's happened here. The reason prices have gone up is because there's too much money in the economy. And the reason for that is because we have a Congress that spends recklessly and they've printed more and more money. And at the center of that has been this administration for the last three and a half years. Not letting them off. I'm not letting the um, other side off the uh, hook, though. Republicans know how to spend our money in a bad way as well. But I got to tell you, you know, folks, this this has to be a lesson on how important it is to be wise with your money. Our ruling elites have spent, spent, spent to stay in power. We've got to be different. We got to gain wealth the right way. Uh, I, I, I think it's really important for us to remember that and be a good steward of your vote as well. Speaking of which here, we have a great clip here from Dan Celia that I'd like to end this segment with talking about how we need to steward your vote well. This was from 2020, but it applies equally to 2024. Here's our founder, Dan Celia, as we near the 2024 election. I hope that we will be thinking about voting and how we're voting and that we are voting the Bible. A vote on a commitment to uphold Judeo-Christian values. It's that that this country was built upon. One that is committed to the values of America. Not only do we need to vote for those values of America, for the Bible, but we have to vote for what most Americans adhere to. One that is anti-abortion, anti-redefinition or redefining of God's word. One that is pro-church, pro-constitution. The things that must be pleasing to the heart of God. Or, on the other hand, we have one that is perfectly fine with abortion, with murdering babies, obviously voting for desiring what most of the left would be okay with. They would say murdering a baby at any age is not only okay, but redefining God's word is okay. And it must be in order for them to get the agenda through that they want to get through. They understand that they've got to continue to min minimize Christians. They've got to minimize the Christian way of life. If we are not minimized, then it's going to be very difficult for them to put through the radical Marxist agenda. If they can't do something to put away a moral compass such as the Bible, they will have a difficult time getting their agenda fully in place. Oh, they will pack the courts, as I said a year ago they will do. Now everybody's talking about it because they have no choice. They are not going to let what is happening, what's happened through this president happen again. They had a president for eight years that did more for the progressive movement than they've been able to accomplish in the last 20 years. And they sit back and watch this president unwind it all. And them starting over again. They're never going to allow that to happen again. And the only way they can assure that doesn't happen again is to be able to legislate from the Supreme Court. If they can't have the supreme legislative branch of the government, then they're in big trouble. They don't want a Supreme Court that is going to legislate, not legislate, but make decisions according to the Constitution. That doesn't help them. There is little we can say except you, if you're a patriot, you've got to vote for America and vote for the Bible. You've got to vote your values. Vote to truly save America. Vote for giving senior citizens the right to go to whatever doctor they want to go to, to make Medicare, Social Security strong. 
to put all Americans that want to work back to work to return our economy back to where it was just seven or eight months ago. The economy that this president built and the economy that can continue the momentum that we had before the pandemic. We have to keep America strong for future generations. We've got to be proud of America with strong military and mighty power to keep the peace. We got to get back to our exceptionalism and not apologize for it for future generations and future prosperity. Boy, we sure do here, folks. You know, our nation stands on the edge of a knife, and uh, this this is one of the most important that we have coming up here. I hope that you will consider stewarding your vote according to the Bible. Thanks for being with us today. If you have to leave us, hope you have a great rest of the day. we got more financial issues coming up right after this. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Is inflation, national debt, and volatility in the markets causing you anxiety? Well, you're not alone. I'm Shanna Burt, host of Financial Issues, a nationally syndicated, biblically-based program. During our daily program, we help you navigate the current financial climate and provide valuable insights so that you can be a good steward with the money that God has blessed you with. The Bible tells us not to worry and to seek wise counsel, and that's why Financial Issues is here. Join our partnership community by visiting financialissues.org slash join. Hi, this is Sheena Burt, the host of Financial Issues. The Financial Issues family is so blessed to have saved tens of thousands of babies, all thanks to the generous support of you, our listeners and viewers. For $140, you can sponsor five ultrasounds. Please go to preborn.org. That's preborn.org or financialissues.org and click on the preborn logo. Save a baby, save a life. So I'm trying to plan ahead and I thought investing would be a good idea. I was going to buy some stock from Back4 Tech Inc. Yeah, they're actually under investigation for supplying technology that helps human traffickers. Oh, what about micro drafts? They support the gambling industry. U.S. Cardboard Company. People always need cardboard. Abortion lobbyists. How do you know all this? I just go by the stock list from financial issues. Huh. Feel confident and rest assured that your money is not supporting the things that grieve the heart of God. For more information, go to financialissues.org to find out how you can be biblically responsible with your investments. Go to financialissues.org today. Grow your money God's way. Initially, when we became members, I thought, what if this doesn't work? I mean, we're going to give up this whole concept of insurance, you know, and we're going to trust God and His people? And I was like, Yeah, well, of course. (laughs) You know, I'm going to trust an insurance company to come through for me, or I'm going to trust the church to come through for me. And that's a no-brainer. I love getting the monthly uh, share that I uh, give to each month that has the name of a real person um, and their real real medical concerns and a prayer request, you know, for them. If I have a need, I know I can go get care, I can see the providers I want to see, I don't have to worry if they're in my network, (laughs) Um, and if we need uh, medical care, the Samaritan is there. A community of Christians paying one another's medical bills. For more information, go to financialissues.org and click the Samaritan Ministries banner. Thanks for listening to this Best of Financial Issues. Securities offered through G.A. Reppel & Company, a registered broker, dealer, and investment advisor, member FINRA and SIPC. Opinions expressed by Shanna are hers alone and are for informational purposes only and do not necessarily represent those of G.A. Reppel or the outlet on which you are listening. You should consider how the information applies to your situation prior to personally implementing it and consult any financial professional you work with to make sure it's applicable to your financial plan. 
Well, it's good to be back with you all today on Financial Issues. Grateful for you. Thanks for joining us here on the program today. Hey, a couple of announcements for you folks. Tomorrow we got the Financial Issues Bible Study. I hope you'll join us for that. I have a somewhat major announcement that I'm going to be making. It's not any shakeup in leadership or anything like that. Some of you may be hoping for that, but no, it's actually specifically a uh, announcement about what our next book study is going to be. This is a book that many of you have requested, so I'd encourage you to join our Bible study for that 6.30 tomorrow, 6.30 Eastern Time, 5.30 Central Time for that announcement there. But right now, I have a special treat for you. I have the founder and president of the Timothy Plan, dear friend of mine in our ministry, Art Alley, is on with me. Welcome back, Art. It's great to have you back again, brother. Thanks for joining me. Special treat. Man, I hope we're recording this. This I, is I, good. I think so. I think we're recording. Right. Well, hopefully yeah, we okay. are. Good. Good to be with you, Seth. <laughs> Likewise, brother. Thank you for uh, joining me. Art, let's begin with just some of your insight on what happened last week with the markets. I know we're seeing uh, you know, a bit of an upturn after that. Seems like there's been a lot of volatility, which should not surprise us, but I know for many of us, it can spook us a little bit. What are your thoughts on what happened last week and how we continue to just stay stabilized as we're seeing some of these things happen? Man, uh, I think last week was maybe, I hate to say it, but indicative of where we are. Yeah. Uh, things are not well in America. However, however, short term is what you're talking about. And short term, right. markets act on greed and fear, yep. always have, probably always will, but never lose track of, of the fact that Nobody invests in the stock market, per se. It's a market of stocks. And if you're investing in quality companies that are profitable, good uh, debt ratios and good management and innovative in products, it doesn't really matter what the day-to-day -day fluctuations are. If the company is solid, and that's why we have the uh, Timothy uh, Art Alley does not manage, uh, I want to say that to make everybody comfortable, <laughs> I do not manage the funds. What we add to the mix is we engage uh, best of class money managers in every different asset class, but we restrict them uh, on what they can in not invest in for Timothy because we do our research here in-house. Uh, deep research, got a team of, I guess, seven people now do nothing but dig in and find out what these companies are up to. Uh, and Wall Street, in way too many cases, is not our friend. They're trying to destroy our culture, our country, our values. And it makes no sense to me. I know it didn't make sense to Dan. Uh, he admonished them, and when he'd go off on one of his rants, I mean, they had to duck for cover. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's no logical reason why they do what they do, but they're doing it. And if they're going to keep doing it, we will not own shares of those companies. Mm. So long answer to a short question, but you know, we are in volatile times. Uh, America is uh, not financially in good shape. Uh, leadership in America, the, especially the deep state, is a huge problem. We've got an election coming up that could at least start, if it goes the right way and they're not able to steal this one, could start exposing and eliminating some of those deep state problems we have. But you can't get past uh, the fact that we're over $35 trillion in debt, which is totally unsustainable as a nation. And because of uh, all this inflationary policies of, of the administration, mm. people at, are at an all-time high of personal credit card debt mm. of over a trillion dollars. That's a real problem. So we need to back off. We need to start spending, stop spending money we don't have. We need to be paying down debt instead of just polluting it up uh, into the stratosphere, personal and national. Mm. And so do corporations. But bottom line, you know, I think the pendulum is finally, finally swinging back to some common sense. Uh, people have gotten squeezed enough where they recognize, you know, something's wrong here. And why would I keep on doing the same thing and expect different results? 
I think we're going to have a, a really good change in administration. I hope so. Because mm, uh, America is still uh, the best option in the world. Oh, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of best options, of course, you talked, you had, you know, hinted as you were talking there about, you know, staying, staying put, not worrying about the short term stuff. Reminded me, Art, as I was thinking, you know, as you were talking there, uh, in a, in a marriage, you don't run for the hills after the first fight or the second fight, you fight through it. Right. I mean, it'd be silly to just flee. And I feel like it's that same outlook. We got to have that long term outlook. We're committed to this. Right. Yeah, can I inject a little humor into that comment? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's a simple question. Uh, you give me the answer. Why is it that the woman always seems to have the last word in any argument? <laughs> any idea? My guess would be because she talks more, but I could be in real trouble with my wife if I said that. What is the answer? There you go. Well, the better answer is anything you would say after that Starts a whole new argument. There you so go. You get, yeah, there you go. That's experience right there. Talking. Amen, brother. And every Amen. listener, uh, you know, and viewer, they can relate to that. But, yep. uh, you know, thank God for marriage. And, Amen. Uh, you know, marriage is the bedrock of any culture. It sure is. However, in today's culture, if Jesus Christ is not the center of your marriage, you're in trouble. Mm, amen. Uh, there's way too many forces, uh, but that's off off uh, subject. So it, it, but but had to throw know, that in there. You know what? Are, it's you're you're exactly right, and I I think we're seeing you know similar things with so many of these companies. Like you said, they're supporting these agendas that are connected to the dismantling of the family, the dismantling of God's design for marriage. And Absolutely. Christians have a real opportunity here to stand up and say, no, you know what? There's a better way to do this. You know, God yeah. created man and woman in his image to bear children, to have children, and to teach those children the gospel. And that's how flourishing happens. Yeah. You know, uh, that's a good point, Seth. And, uh, you know, I, I've said for, I don't know, 50 years, it's always about the money. Yeah. Yep. Now, the other side, the bad guys, understood that. Yep. They have weaponized money. Well, our side, the people with traditional values and common sense, which is kind of uncommon today, but <laughs> common sense, uh, yep. live and let live. You know, you're, you're not knocking on my door. I'm good. I'm, I'm pursuing the uh, American dream of unlimited prosperity, but we're waking up. Yeah. And it is about the money and corporate America, you know, politicians, man, uh, I've always said they may not know much, but they know how to count. They sure do. So if, yep. if people will stand up, they will change some policies. But corporations are the same way. Mm. If we stop investing and spending money for their products in these corporations that are trying to destroy us, sooner or later, they're going to wake up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I know Dan spent a career trying to wake them up, but we can wake them up by coming out from among them and being separate. Uh, Second Corinthians six seventeen. Mm, yeah, you know yep. God's way only works every time. <laughs> what if we would quit investing? You know, and, and the example I like to use, Seth, is Target. You yep. know, uh, well, I, I've used uh, Bud Light. You know, I kind of wish I drank Bud yep. Light so I could stop <laughs> drinking it, but I don't That's drink right. it anyway, so I'm not. A, but Target, likewise. You know, moms when they went so woke uh, with the, uh, you know caving in to this transgender and all these other ungodly things, moms voted with their feet. They yeah. stopped shopping at Target. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is you may stop shopping at Target, but if you look at your investment portfolio, you might very well own Target stock. And so you're betting against yourself anyway. So it's time to come out from among them and be separate. That's what Timothy brings to the table. We will not own shares of companies like that. Uh, and uh, nor should you if you have any traditional values because you're betting against yourself. Amen. Make Amen. sense? It makes yeah. a ton of sense. And I'm, I'm so grateful, Art, for you guys, for Timothy Plan. You guys do that hard work. You know, I... 
Let's face it, you know this, you would agree with me. I'm a simple guy. I don't seem like all that bright of a guy. I need Timothy Plan to be able to do that work for me in your mutual funds and ETFs to be able to make sure that uh, those those companies are screen and clean and that they're keeping our portfolios pure. And man, we just appreciate you guys so much, Art. I, I know we had just passed your guys' 30th anniversary celebration. What's on the horizon for Timothy Plan as you guys continue to lead in this fight? Uh, we're just going to stay the course. Yeah. You know, we, we yeah. cannot compromise. God called us to do this. Yep. Over these 30 years, we have had numerous opportunities to compromise. We'd be six, seven, ten times larger than we mm. are. That's not what he called us to do. He called us to be faithful. Uh, so we're going to continue that. Uh, I kind of had to promise my staff no more new funds because every time we do, it causes a lot of extra work <laughs> around here. Uh, but, you know, we're open to uh, yeah. whatever uh, uh, channels the Lord opens up for us. Mm, amen. Folks, check him out, timothyplan.com, timothyplan.com. Art, I appreciate you so much, your love for our ministry and for being biblically responsible. You are a blessing to us. And I just thank you so much for joining me on the program, brother. We'll be back right after this break, folks. More financial issues coming up. Gain valuable insights from partners sharing about financial issues. When you work so hard, all of us do, to get this money, and I knew nothing about how to use it appropriately, biblically. And it just, it, the strategy is so simple. You guys are on the front line of the battle. My wife and I have been partners with you for several years, and we have benefited greatly from your advice and your ministry. I do nothing without following FISM's advice on stocks, and especially since it's coming from a spiritual foundation. You are amazing. Nobody is doing what you are doing for the body of Christ. Hey, I just wanted to call and thank you for the advice that you gave me a little over a year ago. It has panned out very well. I never dreamed I'd be able to give money like this. Become a partner today by simply going to financialissues.org slash join. Click the green button to become a partner today. How is Timothy Plan continuing to lead the fight as you guys now enter your fourth decade uh, of, of leading this fight of, of biblically responsible investing? We've been too silent for too long and we can no longer be silent. You stand up uh, like Ronald Reagan said, you know, we're only one generation away from losing all of our liberty. Yeah. It has to be fought for. Mm. I wish it didn't. Uh, and you can fight for it. You don't need guns and ammunition on that. You can fight for it, especially with your dollars, because it's always about the money. Mm. And when the money uh, starts impacting people, they start paying attention. Uh, you know, when we launched this, they said it couldn't be done, but yeah. here we are 30 years later. Uh, they said you couldn't get competitive returns, but here we are. What a tremendous testament of God's grace. Go to financialissues.org forward slash Timothy Plans to learn more about Timothy Plan. Thanks for listening to this best of financial issues. The opinions and recommendations expressed on this program do not necessarily represent the opinions of the station or any of the program sponsors. Additionally, all products or services offered by the program sponsors may not be known by the program. 610-363-1110. You've got about a minute and a half to get your call queued up if you want to get in on the show today and get your um, spineless weasel mug. 610-363-1110. So we had to cut Marvin a little bit short right there before the ag and the break. So we're going to bring Marvin back. And uh, I think Marvin has a follow-up question, don't you, Marvin? Yes, ma'am. So um, one other piece of information. I do have a pension um, from the uh, primary job I left in 2016. My wife will get a portion of that when I pass. Um, so with all of that considered, if she goes out at 62 on Social Security and then I wait till 67 or 70 for uh, my Social Security, um, she will, if I pass, she will be able to get the higher spousal benefit even though she went out early on 62? Yes, she will. She gets the, the option of hers or um, the, the spousal. The spousal of of yours, yeah. If it's higher, she can bump up. 
Okay. So mm-hmm. the other thing is I'm working for the state uh, remotely. I'm working for them, and I'm limited to 29 hours a week. That's my full-time job right now. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, yeah, um, you know, we're looking to see how God wants to use us going forward, and we're um, pouring into our church. It's just bought their first building. So oh, that's he's awesome. Really that's blessing, exciting, man. He's really blessing us in this area. Um, but if I go out early on Social Security because I have my pension, then any spousal would be whatever... I went out at? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So she would still have the option, like if if the spousal benefit is higher, she still has the option to go up. But whether or not the spousal will be higher, I think is really going to be dependent on on when you take it. You know, right. and okay. sounds like, uh, you know, you guys have done retirement right, even though you know, you were able to st- step back from the job that you had when you officially retired. Um, it sounds sounds just like God has been moving in your life since then. You're you're active Absolutely. in your church, and you know, I think that's what God really intended for retirement. Yeah, we're really looking forward to being able to give more as we retire. Um, and that's our awesome. gift to our children was that we were able to pay off their college debts um, when they graduated. So they are starting life off with zero debt. What a what an what a awesome gift, gift! So cool. And that was after so cool. I retired in 2016. Yeah, that's awesome. Well done, good Martin. job, Marvin. Good. Yes. No, it's You're... it's God. It's all God. Yeah, absolutely. I was not on track until I found you guys, and then was planning retirement, and then came on board as a as a partner. Y'all have really blessed me. I really miss Dan. Me too. But I'm glad to see that y'all are continuing. So thank you very much, and God bless right. you. Great. Thank you, Marvin. We we really appreciate those kind words and your support. Yes, sir. That's awesome, Shannon. Boy, what what an amazing gift uh, that Marvin was able to give for his children and for his church. It kind of wraps up what we were talking about in the first part of the show. Like that's, that's how you spend retirement, you know? Yep. It's really cool. Well done. Really cool. Hey, Shannon, we had a question on Slack, uh, uh, excuse me, on Slack, on uh, social media uh, that I wanted to get to here. (laughs) Uh, Joseph and Cecilia from Neptune Beach, Florida, asking the same question about a CD ladder. So they have one that's maturing this month, uh, about 2% f- uh, high in fixed and then 5% high in cash, uh, 82 years old following the income asset allocation model. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but maybe just some guidance on if they're doing that right. Yeah, so right now I would just, um, I would probably stay high in cash. So for the last three or four weeks, we've been writing some commentary. I hope you guys are are logging in and reading that every week. If you're a partner, it just kind of gives you some insight as to, to, you know, where our minds are in in our um, analytical meetings, uh, in our analytical committee. So I would not hesitate to stay just heavy in cash right now. We're starting to see CD rates um, drop. You know, it's it's harder and harder to find those 5%. And uh, the strategy that we put forth, I guess, I don't know, I guess that was about two years ago, maybe, to use the CD ladder uh, between six months and two years um, was sort of temporary. I mean, it was a, a, a variation, you know, on the, the fixed income strategy. Um, to take advantage of where rates were best. And, you know, that's probably coming to an end. So that's why we've recently, you've seen that we've uh, lumped in preferred stocks with the fixed income. So uh, if you're heavy there uh, in cash and you're underweight in your fixed income, then I would look towards those uh, those preferred stocks that we've added. But Cash, uh, as far as I checked yesterday on on my platform, cash was still yielding 4.92%. So that's the case for you. I think that that until there's some things on your buy list for the areas that your tracker is showing that you're light, it's best just to enjoy that uh, that yield. Awesome. All right. Um, let's go to, we've got a call coming in. Let's get to Margaret in Virginia. Hi, Margaret. Hi there. Um, my question is about I bonds. Um, you had said either on the commentary or 
the show to sell them but not be in a panic, sell them when they come due. And yesterday I went on the Treasury Direct website and there's a plethora of information, but I couldn't see exactly how to figure that out. It says you could keep them up to 30 years and if you sell them before five years, you lose three months interest. But um, I wasn't sure. I I purchased mine in 22 Mm -hmm. for my husband and I, the maximum for each of us. And um, I purchased them in August of 2022. And I saw auction time, but, and I may have just missed it, but I start, when I purchased them, they were, the rate was like 9%. And mm-hmm. now it's four two eight. Anyway, I I just didn't know how to find that. Um, so we we put that verbiage up quite a while back, and um, so for the ones that I had done, we had just done a year, and so okay. when they when they came up, there was no penalty to just um, cash out on them. So I'm not sure if you bought the you know, the, the shorter term version, or if you bought something different that, that had a longer term version. So, um, what I would do is just log in and you can probably go through like, you're going to sell it. And I'm sure it's going to tell you, um, if there would be any, any penalty or anything like that. But, you know, with quote unquote inflation coming down, (laughs) if you believe that narrative, (laughs) I guess the official number is coming down. And so, the, the rate on those inflation protected bonds is just going to continue to go down. So, uh, right. you know, that kind of, that strategy has kind of run its course as well. So there's, you know, the, the strategy within the fixed income is sort of evolving again. So, yeah. So I probably missed the boat, but at least, uh, I could go ahead and probably go still do it. So All yeah, right. I, I would just check it out and see what it would, what, what it would be. Um, to do that or when the next window of opportunity is. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thanks, Margaret. Thanks for the call, Margaret. God bless. Uh All right. Um, What do you think, Shannon? You want to squeeze a question in here before the (laughs) Yeah, let's do do that because I don't think I have enough time to talk about Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, We've got a question from Noah on Ask Shanna saying, I'm currently up 70% in E44. It's about 16% of my portfolio. I know you said to cut anything down that's over 5% of our portfolio, but should I wait for the merge of the stock or go ahead and sell some now? Noah's 37. Yep. Good question, Noah. And uh, looks like that question came in yesterday and we sent out an alert yesterday. So I think that will probably answer your question. That particular company is being um, acquired by another company that you may even own as well. So make sure that you search your emails for that alert. If you can't find it, uh, just log into the partner website and go over to the alerts tab and then you can read. We we did uh, a little bit more of a write-up than we usually do when we when we issue a sell. But um, you know, we, we want to get way out ahead of this one. We want to give you an opportunity to, uh, you know, to come up with a strategy because if you own uh, either one of these two positions or both of them, they likely have done very well for you. And so if you own them in a taxable account, you want to, you know, maybe read some of the things that we wrote about coming up with a strategy, uh, an, an exit strategy there. Not necessarily from the whole position because, um, we would actually be a hold on this particular company if it were not being acquired as well as the company that is acquiring it. In addition, both of the companies are sort of on um, BRI watch. <laughs> They're on our watch list. Um, so there's some, you know, some things that indicate that they may be heading in the wrong direction with um, some of the screens that we use for biblically responsible um, activity. So check the alert, um, read it, and read the partner commentary while you're there. Well, folks, I hear the music. That means we got to go for today, but Lord willing, 
We will be back tomorrow uh, for more financial issues. Uh, Pray for the hurricane that's coming in. I think we're clear, but one of our analysts is, is in the path of the hurricane. So pray for the safety of those in the path of the hurricane. And uh, Lord willing, we'll be back with you tomorrow for more financial issues. To remind you, time's getting short. The master's coming back. We want to help you be found good and faithful stewards. Find out more about our ministry at financialissues.org. If we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Thank you for joining us.